Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. What a pleasure to see this great group here on the first day of our 10th annual Aspen Security Forum. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you here on behalf of, of our co-chairs, <laughs> Professor Joe and I of Harvard, who's arriving later, and Professor former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice of Stanford University. We have so many VIPs in the audience, but I have to thank the president of the Aspen Institute, Dan Porterfield, who's done such a fabulous job for us. Please join me in welcoming Dan. And I have to salute my former boss, from whom I have learned so much about how to be a public servant and a great American, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. Uh, my name is Nick Burns. I'm the executive director of the Aspen Strategy Group and the very, very proud new owner of the Aspen Strategy Group of the Aspen Security Forum. I think many of you know about the Aspen Strategy Group. We have been um, here for 35 years. We have been meeting on a nonpartisan political basis. I know it's a radical idea <laughs> in the United States these days that Democrats and Republicans and liberals and conservatives and moderates from the ranks of government and business and journalism and academia can actually come together on a nonpartisan basis. But that is our ethos, and we subscribe to it. And it's a very important part of what the Aspen Institute does as well. We've been here for over three decades off the record in the first weekend in August, but we thought it important especially at a time of some discord, let's face it, and open divisions in America that we in the Aspen Strategy Group support this security forum, a public discussion, public debates about what we need to do together to build a stronger America, and to do so with respect for each other and our differences, with tolerance, with a sense of openness. And if there was ever a time when we needed that kind of spirit that we're all Americans, we're all patriotic. We don't judge each other um, on the basis of party. Now is that time. And we're meeting this week, and this is our first session, at a time of some global import, of a major change in the global balance of power. We're witnessing it right now. I just spent two weeks in China and saw the incredible power play that the Chinese are making in East Asia. For the first time, since the close of the Second World War, other people beyond the United States are beginning to question whether or not the United States is willing and able to remain the global leader that we have been for 70 years. The Aspen Security Forum was founded 10 years ago by its now Chairman Emeritus Clark Irvin. I want to salute Clark for having had the vision to have this public debate every summer here in Aspen. He deserves our applause and our thanks. When Clark started this forum, terrorism was the existential problem that gripped the United States. Al-Qaeda was still trying to blow up American civilian airliners. The United States was deeply enmeshed, as we all remember, in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Ten years later, the Trump administration, quite rightly in my view, now says that two authoritarian powers, China and Russia, are the most significant threats to our national security. We're gonna focus on both of those countries this week if you've looked at our agenda. Russia's continued assault on our electoral system in 2016 and 2018, and you can bet in 2020, it's assault on our media platforms, it's open aggression in Ukraine have to concern all Americans, Republicans and Democrats. China's outright theft of American intellectual property, its power play in the South China Sea, its crackdown on the Uyghur population of Western China as it casts a wary, menacing eye on the incredible events in Hong Kong. It's been striking to see, I think for all of us who've been involved in American foreign policy for a long time, that nearly our entire political leadership, from liberal Democrats to conservative Republicans, now are uniting around a banner of outright competition with China. 
gone is the careful balance of the last four decades between engaging China when we can and opposing China when we must. That was the position of every administration. We now have both political parties swinging towards outright competition. Here's a question for all of us at Aspen this week. Is that the right balance? Of course we have to compete with the Chinese when they cross American interests. But if we want to do anything on global climate change or stabilizing the global economy or addressing a thousand other transnational national issues, it's the other power with capacity. And we're going to have a big debate at the Aspen Strategy Group in a couple of weeks about whether we are in balance or out of balance with China. We're also going to discuss, of course, the threat of a nuclear-armed North Korea and that of Iran, a nuclear weapons wannabe and a dangerous destabilizing force in the Middle East. And there are many other vital issues on the agenda. This is one that I'm sure the Secretary General and Courtney Kuby are going to discuss. Should the United States stay in Afghanistan, the longest war 18 years now in American history? Or should we look for a peaceful way out? How can we combat continued extremism in the Muslim world? How do we face the reality of cyber crime and cyber espionage and cyber terrorism? And very importantly, as we think about China, how do we maintain America's qualitative military edge as our rivals, China and Russia and Iran, develop a new generation of military technology propelled by artificial intelligence and quantum computing and biotechnology and machine learning? And what is our future in space? We mark this week one of the very greatest achievements in all of the history of the United States. Apollo 11's landing on the moon 50 years ago this week, and as President Kennedy foresaw, its safe return to Earth. In addition, there is, of course, the elephant in the room, President Donald Trump and his American First Agenda. His advisors and supporters who will be here this week will be right to point out what his accomplishments are in foreign policy. Strong economic growth, substantial concessions by some of our trade partners, an unapologetic defense of Israel and our relationship with Israel and the Gulf states, continued strong ties to India, our strategic partner in the Indo-Pacific, and the fact that war with, not, with North Korea is not mercifully on the agenda of the Aspen Security Forum this week. His detractors, and I have to be open with you and transparent, I am one of his detractors, will charge that he's weakening our alliances, that he's actually dismantling the global trade order, that he's slashing refugee admittance to the United States during the greatest refugee crisis worldwide, since 1945, and that while he coddles Kim Jong-un, he never misses an opportunity to castigate our great friends, our democratic friends, Angela Merkel and Theresa May. President Trump's policies will be center stage at Aspen this week, and when you think about it, he wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> so we're going to discuss all this in a spirit of bipartisanship, nonpartisanship, of openness, of tolerance for each other and for our differences as Americans. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to our major underwriters, Lockheed Martin, Symantec, and Deloitte. Deloitte's got a base camp in the temp uh, in the meadows that a lot of you will visit. Thank you to our returning partner, Microsoft. Please visit its secure election uh, exhibit here at Aspen Meadows. We're very pleased to welcome our new partners, Accenture, McKinsey & Company, Oracle, and United Launch Alliance. You will not miss the eight-foot rocket at Door Hosier Lobby. We remain very grateful to American Airlines for getting many of you here, and to Capgemini for its support for our scholars program. Finally, last but not least, NBC and MSNBC has been an indispensable partner to the Aspen Security Forum. It's brought us worldwide exposure. It's brought the voices of all of our speakers, like the Secretary General, to a global audience. So it's now time for our first speaker. Uh, we're honored by the participation of the Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg. He is a great friend 
of the United States. He was as Prime Minister of Norway, and he is now as our leader in the Western Alliance in NATO. I think he's also without any doubt. He will never say this as a modest person. He's one of the most important and effective Secretary Generals we've had in the 70-year history of the NATO alliance. Under his leadership, NATO continues to keep the peace in Europe and North America 70 years after we were founded. NATO is helping to effect liberate the 100 million plus East Europeans who now live in free societies and are part of NATO and the European Union after having been unwilling occupants of the Warsaw Pact. I saw this firsthand on 9-11 when I was a very new American ambassador to NATO when we were hit very hard that day. It was NATO, and Tom Korologos will remember this, Ambassador Korologos. NATO came forward, invoked Article 5, our mutual defense clause, went into Afghanistan with us, is still with us today in 2019, and our NATO allies and partners have suffered over 1,000 combat deaths. Mr. Secretary General, we Americans are grateful to have such allies in the world. Thank you for being here. And now let me introduce Sheila Jordan of Symantec, the Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, and Courtney QB of NBC News. Thank you very much. So I get the great honor of doing a little bit of a further introduction of the next, of the next session. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Courtney Kube, who was with NBC News and the Pentagon correspondent, and she will actually be facilitating this interview. It is my great honor to also introduce Mr. Jens Stoltenberg. An economist by education, Mr. Stoltenberg is currently the Secretary General, General of NATO. Before assuming that role, he was twice the Prime Minister of Norway and the leader of the Norwegian Labour Party. He has indeed had a long, illustrious career in Norwegian politics, including a number of ministry posts between 1990 and 1997. Cumulatively, he was a member of the Norwegian Parliament from 1991 through 2014. As Prime Minister, Mr. Stoltenberg, uh, Mr. Stoltenberg was a strong supporter of the transatlantic relationship. He was instrumental in transforming the Norwegian armed forces in increasing defense spending. During his tenure as Prime Minister, Mr. Stoltenberg had to deal with a variety of national security <clears throat> issues, including the threat of terrorism, terrorism and with the reemergence of Russia. Mr. Stoltenberg has, has also pioneered the work of NATO on cyber. Under his leadership, NATO has made cyber defense a core part of collective defense and has recognized cybersecurity or cyber, cyberspace as a domain of military operations. Thanks to Mrs. Stoltenberg's leadership, NATO has also partnered closely with the cybersecurity industry. Speaking on behalf of Symantec, I can say that the partnership with NATO has been one of the most successful and all-encompassing with governments around the world. Please join me in a warm welcome for Mrs. Stoltenberg. Thank you very much. I have to say I am so honored and humbled to be part of the opening panel for Aspen 2019. Um, and I want to get right into it because we have so many issues that we want to cover with the Secretary General here. In the news this week, uh, we're less than two weeks or just about two weeks away from the INF Treaty potentially falling apart. Of course, most of you know this is the intermediate range uh, missile treaty that the U.S. and Russia entered into in the 19, late 1980s. The U.S. announced they were going to withdraw from it, and the deadline for Russia to come into compliance with that is August 2nd. A U.S. Uh, delegation traveled to Geneva, met with the Russians to talk about arms control today. Is there any indication that Russia might be moving towards compliance or there might be some hope for the treaty? No, there is no indication that... Uh... <laughs> No. Thank you, no. Uh, there are no indications that Russia is moving uh, back into compliance with the, the INF uh, uh, treaty, but we continue to call on them, uh, uh, knowing that it's only three weeks left until we meet the deadline the 2nd of August, and after that, the INF treaty will not exist anymore. Uh, but the reason why we continue to call on them to come back into compliance is that this treaty is so extremely important. It is cornerstone for arms control in uh, Europe. 
Um, and I am part of a European generation uh, poli uh, of politicians who were actually shaped uh, by the deployment of the Russian SS-20 missiles in the 70s and the 80s and the NATO Pershing and cruise missiles as a response to the Russian missiles. And, we, and I have to be honest with you, I've been out demonstrating it against those missiles uh, with a lot of uh, friends with long hair and uh, mm -hmm. quite radical uh, attitudes. Uh, uh, but then we uh, were so pleased uh, when uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, and Gorbachev signed the INF Treaty in 1987, not reducing the number of uh, these missiles, but banning all of them, zero. Uh, and now Russia has started to deploy these missiles again. Uh, now the name is SSC-8. Uh, they are different, but uh, the same uh, uh, say, uh, threat. They are mobile, hard to detect, it can reach all European cities within minutes and uh, reducing the, the warning time and therefore also reducing the, the, the threshold for any potential use of nuclear weapons in an armed conflict. Therefore, it is extremely serious that Russia is violating the treaty. Uh, and, uh, and actually, the Obama administration started to, uh, to raise this uh, issue with uh, 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 Russia. Uh, uh, they denied, of course, but all allies, uh, and many of them independently, has come to the same conclusion that Russia is in violation, that they are deploying these, uh, these new missiles, and therefore all NATO allies also supported the United States when the United States decided in the beginning of February that they will start the withdrawal process. That process takes six months. At the end of that process, which ends on the 2nd of August uh, uh, this year, uh, there will be no more INF uh, treaty in, uh, in, uh, in the world. So uh, we are also preparing for a world without the treaty and with more Russian missiles. I can say something about what we are going to prepare for, but uh, I've already answered quite long. So uh, <laughs> and my advice has told me one thing, not be long in your no. answers. So, uh, this I is Aspen. There's no rules here. Okay, okay. I, that's what I was told. So then the question is, what will we do? Uh, also, if they don't come back into compliance. Uh, we have stated and we have decided that we will respond uh, what we will do will be measured, it will be coordinated as a NATO family, no bilateral arrangement, but NATO as an alliance, 29 allies. Um, we will not mirror what Russia is doing, meaning that we will not uh, uh, deploy uh, uh, missile uh, defense. Uh, we uh, have increased readiness of forces. Uh, we will also uh, uh, support the new initiatives of, uh, because we have to make sure that also in a world without the INF Treaty and with more Russian missiles, we need to be able to uh, continue to deliver credible uh, deterrence and defense uh, from NATO because that's the best guarantee to preserve uh, peace uh, in, uh, in Europe. So NATO is, gonna, is going to employ or deploy some sort of a missile defense system that's geared in Europe, geared specifically towards Russia? We already have an integrated air and missile defense in Europe, uh, but of course one option is to strengthen that. Uh, I am a bit careful to be too specific, partly because we are still uh, calling on Russia to come back into compliance, and we don't want to give them any excuse for not coming back into compliance. Uh, 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 second, uh, because I think it is uh, important that we launch uh, or that we announce the concrete measures when we see, also, that the, also after the 2nd of August, and some of the uh, measures will uh, it takes some time to implement. Some others will uh, be possible to implement more quickly. Uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and we also have to understand that the new Russian missiles is, are actually part of a broader pattern. So Russia has modernized the nuclear weapons over a long time. And they have uh, invested in new uh, modern military capabilities over a long time. And therefore, NATO, in many ways, have already started to respond, not by deploying new nuclear weapons in Europe, but by increasing our uh, uh, military strength in Europe. For the first time in the history of our alliance, we have combat-ready troops in the eastern part of the alliance. In the three Baltic countries uh, and in Poland, uh, one of them led by the United States. Uh, and these combat uh, battalions or uh, combat groups are not very big, but there are multinational NATO troops, meaning that NATO is already there. So if any of those countries are attacked, there is no doubt that it will trigger the response from the full uh, uh, alliance. And we have also increased the ability, the readiness of our forces to reinforce quickly if needed. So in many ways, NATO has already started uh, to respond in a measured defensive way 
uh, to a more assertive Russia, and the new nuclear missiles are extremely important uh, and extremely serious, but they are part of a broader picture we have seen developing over some time. But that enhance, I mean, that really began after the invasion of Crimea, right? NATO enhancing the, yeah. against an aggressive Russia. It, it, so, do you know how many of these INF violating missiles Russia has? I the know, launchers? but I can't tell you. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so in, in nineteen eighty, they know that we know. Yeah. yeah. So in 1987, it took from mid-1988, I guess, until about 1991 for all the 2,700 or so missiles to be destroyed, which, as you mentioned, the, the treaty bans these missiles and their launchers, which means to be in compliance, you have to destroy them. Is it even logistically possible at this point for Russia to, become, to come into compliance and destroy all their missiles? So, as you mentioned, last time in 1987, they were able to uh, destroy as a, uh, almost 2,000 missiles in, in, in a matter of weeks. So, so uh, it is possible to start to destroy missiles if they want. And so if we really saw a real willingness from Russia to start to destroy these missiles, I'm certain that we would have been able to find a way to to save the treaty, but we have, so NATO and the United States has raised this issue with Russia for years. Uh, in the beginning, they denied the existence of the missile. Then they had to accept that the missile exists, but they said that the missile doesn't violate the INF uh, treaty. That's wrong. Uh, as I said, the US, but also other allies have independently uh, uh, so assessed, uh, uh, determined that these missiles are violating uh, the treaty. And that's the reason why we also have uh, said that there has to be a limit, because if we accept that Russia violates this treaty with impunity, then we are not only undermining the INF treaty, but we are weakening the credibility of all arms control uh, treaties. If Russia thinks that they can just violate the treaty without consequence, then uh, uh, with what kind of credibility with all the other treaties uh, we have, uh, have if we accept that? But with all due respect, they've been in violation of the treaty for years. As you mentioned, President Obama brought it up with Vladimir Putin years ago. So what kind of deterrent can you employ after the treaty assumes it, it, it falls apart in a couple of weeks? What kind of deterrent can you possibly employ? Could you, you, you mentioned you don't want any ground launch cruise missiles or ground launch missiles, but what about air launched or sea launched? Or, I mean, could you, could you have a nuclear deterrent that's just not ground based? I will answer that in a moment, but, but, but fundamentally, the most important deterrent NATO uh, uh, provides is one for all and all for one. And as long as that's credible, that if you attack one small ally or a big ally, the whole alliance will respond. Then we are by far the strongest alliance in, in the world. We are 50% of the world, uh, uh, world's military might. So we are strong and stronger than any other potential adversary as long as we are together. So, so of course, it is important what we do. Uh, but the most important thing is to resolve the political will, the unity of the alliance. As long as that's in place, then we are safe, all of us. Uh, um, uh, so that's my first answer. Um, and, and, and to be honest, that's, uh, I'm, I'm from Norway, and uh, Norway is a beautiful country. We have beautiful mountains, but I have to admit that you have beautiful mountains <laughs> here too. Uh, uh, so I'm actually considering to come back to do some hiking and uh, some downhill skiing, uh, or some, some skiing. They, they told me actually that you don't only do downhill skiing here, but also cross-country skiing. That's even better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's good. For, it's good cardio. So, were you, you talking see, about uh, skiing to avoid my question on air launch cruise? No, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm just asking. Partly. I'll talk about no. skiing too. No, but 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 we uh, first of all we have uh, 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 air launched uh, nuclear weapons. That's part of uh, uh, NATO's nuclear deterrent in Europe, and that's no 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 secret. Uh, we have uh, we call it uh, some, it's some, something we do, we do together. It's. The, the, the weapons are owned by the United States, mm -hmm. but the planes are owned by different European allies. And then uh, the different support uh, and, uh, capabilities and so on are owned by and operated by other allies. So, 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 so the air-launched nuclear uh, component of our uh, uh, as a nuclear deterrent uh, is really a joint effort by uh, many allies. Uh, so that's, of course, part of... Uh, our deterrent and, and, and will be also part of the deterrence we have uh, after the potential demise of the, the INF uh, uh, treaty. Uh, yeah. There was a disclosure just this week, actually, of a report that, that acknowledged that, in fact, there were 130 nuclear bombs across five NATO nations that were belonged to NATO, essentially. Um, 
and, and, and as you mentioned, this is, it's, it's been widely known, but this is sort of an official way of acknowledging where those, those weapons are and that they actually exist. In, and it also included some talk of the US nuclear component that's overseas as well. Did that concern you, that disclosure, and particularly the acknowledgement that there's actually, there are nuclear weapons at INSER like just miles mm. from the Syrian border? So I don't comment on uh, the details uh, of uh, our nuclear uh, uh, deterrent uh, where we have deployed the uh, weapons. Uh, uh, but uh, it is official, it's public, that we have uh, air-launched uh, systems uh, and that uh, different allies uh, uh, so deliver this uh, uh, together. Uh, this paper is not actually a NATO paper. It's, uh, it's a, it's a draft from the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, uh, some parliamentarians, so it's not a paper from me or from, from the NATO uh, uh, structures. But uh, uh, I can, so I cannot confirm what is there. But of course, if we have nuclear weapons in Europe, we have them somewhere in Europe. Uh, so I cannot deny that. <laughs> but I actually forgot the reason why I mentioned Norway. They, that was not because of the mountains, but it was because of deterrence. I mean, Norway, five million people, and I remember when I was, uh, uh, doing my conscription, I was a, as a soldier back in the, the late 70s, uh, at the height of the Cold War. And we were bordering Russia. Uh, but, I, 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 but I felt safe. Because I knew that if Norway was attacked, the whole of NATO, including the United States, will be there. And as long as deterrence is credible, and deterrence is in the mind of your potential adversary, as long as your potential adversary knows that we will be together, then he will not attack. So credible deterrence is the best way not to provoke a conflict, but to prevent the conflict. But I just have to push back on the deterrence a little bit, because you know, it's, while this is, it seems that the NATO alliance has been able to deter an actual attack on the NATO allies from Russia, NATO, Russia continues to push the line. So the deployment of these potentially nuclear ground launch cruise missiles, uh, you know, right on, on NATO's doorstep. At, at what point is it not deterring Russian behavior considered not effective deterrence. It's, de it's deterring an actual attack, but Russia's walking right up to the door, armed and, and ready for an attack. But I think for deterrence to be credible, it has to be very clear what we are deterring. And that we are deterring an armed attack on a NATO ally. Uh, of course, we would like to see Russia change their behavior. Uh, but we have seen before that Russia is behaving in a way we don't like, uh, or, 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 or the Soviet Union. That was very much the case during the Cold War. Then the, Russia had many more nuclear weapons and many more combat ready troops just at our border. Uh, uh, and then uh, we really needed deterrence, as, uh, saying that if you cross that border, then the whole uh, alliance will uh, uh, respond. So deterrence is working. That doesn't mean that Russia behaves exactly as we want, but it means that since we established NATO, no NATO ally has suffered a military attack. Uh, and, and, and we are the most successful uh, alliance in history because we have been able to deliver that. The challenge now is that we are faced with new threats, which is not, what should I say, the classical military attack uh, as an army is crossing borders or missiles crossing borders, but cyber uh, uh, meddling in, 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 in democratic processes, election processes, uh, we had a Skripal case in 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 UK uh, where a, a nerve and chemical agent was used uh, on the territory of a NATO ally. Uh, these these what we call hybrid uh, attacks or hybrid warfare, they blur the line between peace and war. Before it, it was very easy to say whether it was peace and war. Again, I'm from Europe, and in and the Second World War in Europe started uh, for my as in my country the 9th of April, and it ended the 8th of May. And there was no, no question where it took place. When we now are faced with cyber attacks, it's hard to say when you are attacked, where you are attacked, who, you are, uh, who is uh, uh, attacking you, uh, or the fight against Daesh. It's hard to say when it started, where it took place, and when it's going to, going to end. So we are faced with a much more difficult kind of threats. Uh, uh, this blurred line, uh, or hybrid threats, which is blurring the line between peace and, uh, and, uh, and the war. 
Another NATO ally that's been in the news a lot lately is Turkey, with their acceptance of some of the components for S-400 radar. Uh, the White House put out a statement about it today saying that accepting the S-400 undermines the commitment all NATO allies made to each other to move away from Russian systems. The U.S. military also is saying that the S-400 endangers military intelligence, that it, the radars allow um, Russia to be able to read intelligence on this joint strike fighter, this new advanced um, aircraft that Turkey was supposed to take uh, possession of and they are no longer will. One critical part of the NATO alliance is this integrated interoperability, integrated air defense systems. A Russian-made air defense system like the S-400 cannot be integrated with NATO. So what does that mean going forward now that Ru Turkey has taken possession of it? Are there technical changes that NATO members now have to make to exclude Turkey from having access to their systems and are, are there physical air defense infrastructure that has to be altered? The S-400, the Russian air defense system, uh, uh, is not possible to integrate into the uh, integrated NATO air and missile system, which is about you know sharing radar picture, which is about uh, joint air policing, which is about uh, also shared uh, capabilities. Uh, uh, and Turkey has not asked for that. So, so, so the SS-400 will not be integrated into uh, NATO's air and missile defense system. Um, um, but Turkey can still be part, also with other capabilities, uh, uh, Turkey will and, uh, and is still part of NATO's uh, integrated air and missile defense. Uh, they have uh, also planes, they have uh, radars, they have other uh, capabilities which are important for our uh, air and missile uh, defense. Um, it is up to each and every nation to decide what kind of systems they acquire. Uh, but what matters, what, but what matters for NATO is interoperability, and the S-400 system will not be in Erdogan with, in Washington with, with, with President Trump and and and, uh, and other officials. And 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 of course, we try to avoid to end in the situation where we are now, where uh, two allies so fundamentally disagree, and where uh, Turkey as a I'm concerned about the consequences of the Turkish decision because it means that Turkey will not be part of the F-35 program anymore. I actually visited Lockheed Martin at Fort Worth, uh, I think a year ago or something, and I saw the production lines, and I saw the different flags of the different uh, allies uh, producing, also, um, uh, having uh, planes coming out uh, from, from that production line, and there were also Turkish planes there, uh, but now they will not be part of that. That's, that's not, not good, uh, it's bad for all of us, but it's a consequence of that decision. And, uh, uh, and therefore what I welcome is the direct uh, ongoing dialogue, contact between two uh, NATO allies, uh, Turkey and the United States on this issue. I know that they are talking about uh, Turkey acquiring Patriot systems. Uh, uh, Turkey is also talking with two other NATO allies, Italy and France, about acquiring SAMP-T, uh, Italian-French system, also air defense system. And we have to remember that NATO is augmenting Turkish air defenses today. We have deployed a Patriot battery, a Spanish Patriot battery in Turkey, and we have deployed Italian uh, 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 SAMP-T battery in Turkey, so as a part of NATO uh, assurance measures for Turkey. So, so we, we do what we can, uh, but... Uh, and now we are in a difficult situation because of the consequences of this uh, 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 decision. But it's not just, I mean, there, there's also the symbolism of it, that, that Turkey, you know, they were trying to acquire the Patriot, it didn't work out, but the United States under President Trump has said that the U.S. would figure out a way to sell them. In fact, they've even offered to help with some of the cost of it to encourage Turkey to, to, for, to get another Patriot battery and not to buy the S-400. And, and Turkey, in a, symbolically, turned towards Russia and bought this system knowing that it would mean no F-35, no interoperability of the air defense system with, with S-400. So what does that mean? It's, 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 is this Turkey turning away from NATO and towards Russia? No. Uh, this is a serious issue. Uh, it's about uh, uh, S-400 and F-35. But NATO's, uh, uh, sorry, Turkish, Turkish contributions to NATO and NATO's co cooperation with the NATO ally, uh, Turkey, runs much deeper and it's much broader than uh, F-35, even though that's important. Uh, for instance, Turkey is a key ally in the fight against Daesh, ISIS. The fact that we have been able, through their global coalition, uh, uh, to defeat Daesh, to liberate all the territory Daesh controlled in Iraq and Syria. They control the territory as big as the United Kingdom, 8 million people, 
and that now they don't control that territory anymore. That's not least because of the contributions of Turkey. We have used the basis infrastructure, uh, and Turkey has played a key part in that uh, fight. Uh, uh, Turkey is contributing to many different NATO missions and operations in the Balkans and Kosovo and also in Afghanistan. So, so I'm not underestimating uh, the difficulty related to uh, S-400, but I'm saying that uh, Turkey uh, as a NATO member is much more than S-400. There's some, uh, some people who, you know, commentators are saying that Turkey deserves to be kicked out of NATO because of this, which of course there's no mechanism for doing. But, um, does it, do you, are there other members, other NATO allies who are expressing that kind of sentiment that they don't trust Turkey anymore with this decision that, that they have, in, in essence, with the activation of the S-400, they're opening up a door that potentially exposes other NATO allies to, to spying? And the, the, the NATO, the, sorry, Turkey is a NATO member. Turkey is an important NATO member, and no ally has raised that issue uh, uh, at all, uh, because they, 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 we all see that we are dependent on each other. Then, we did, then, there are the, uh, then there is a disagreement on the issue of S-400. That's correct. And I think that my responsibility is partly to try to help to solve the issue, but as long as that issue is not solved, we need to minimize the negative consequences and also highlight, as the White House does in the statement today, that uh, 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 the partnership, the, 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 the alliance, uh, the, the, the role of Turkey in, in NATO is much broader than uh, uh, F-35 or S-400. Ambassador Burns talked about the importance of Afghanistan. There's talks right now, potential peace talks. Um, NATO forces are there and committed until 2020, but it's a conditions-based based mission. If Ambassador Khalilzad, Zama Khalilzad, if he's successful and negotiates a peace deal, it could have an impact on NATO forces deployed to Afghanistan. You've said numerous times that he, he briefs you frequently, he, he keeps the NATO allies in, in touch with what, what he's doing, but if in fact he comes to a peace deal that leads to the full withdrawal of all NATO troops, Resolute Support Mission troops, Will NATO have a veto over that? Will, you have, will NATO have any kind of a part in the, in the negotiations for what that would look like? So we are very much involved in that now. Uh, we consult uh, with uh, Ambassador Khalizad uh, frequently. I speak with him. He has been in, in, in the NATO um, North Atlantic Council many times. Uh, 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 we have our um, uh, NATO representative in Kabul, uh, so closely linked up to the negotiations. So, of course, this is a U.S. envoy, but, but all NATO allies are involved. Because we went into Afghanistan together, uh, we are going to make decisions of future posture together, and when the time is right, we'll also leave together. Because we have to remember that, uh, as uh, Nick Burns said, uh, the first and only time NATO invoked the Collective Defense Clause, Article 5, was after an attack on the United States. I think everyone expected that the, that, that the Article 5 was for, you know, uh, Soviet Union attacking a small NATO ally. No, that never happened because uh, the terrorists worked. Uh, but then suddenly we had an attack on the United States, 9-11. And, 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 and all allies stood behind the United States. Uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, European uh, soldiers, Canadian soldiers, have served in Afghanistan, and more than 1,000 have paid the ultimate price. And, and we had, at the peak, we had more than 140,000 troops there in the combat operation, roughly one-third uh, at some t stage even more than uh, of those soldiers were non-US soldiers. So this has been a big operation, not only for the United States, but for uh, many uh, NATO allies and, uh, and partners. Therefore, we will decide on the future presence in Afghanistan together. We strongly support the, the, the efforts uh, by Abbas al-Khalisad uh, to reach an agreement with the uh, Taliban. We will not stay in Afghanistan longer than needed. We have been able to go from 140,000 to now roughly 16,000, uh, to go from a combat operation with uh, casualties and, 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 and to train, assist, and advise, uh, uh, advise mission with uh, very much fewer casualties. And, uh, and of course, we, we hope that Khalizad will uh, succeed. Uh, this is not a, a leave uh, deal we are seeking, but a peace deal, meaning that it has to uh, secure that Afghanistan doesn't once again become a safe haven for international terrorists. It has to secure 
uh, inter-Afghan dialogue on how to maintain uh, also the, the gains we have made there. We have invested heavily blood and treasure in Afghanistan for many years. Uh, um, uh, and of course, it will affect the presence of uh, international forces, NATO forces, US forces in, in Afghanistan. In what way? It's a bit early to say, because that's now negotiated. I hope we will see a result. And, and as uh, Secretary Pompeo said, I think it was a NATO meeting recently, uh, uh, hopefully uh, something uh, uh, so within uh, weeks or months. So, 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 so we hope, uh, but nothing is agreed be before everything is agreed, and therefore it's a bit early to try to speculate about the different elements. And the, the Taliban have been pretty open about the fact that they want all foreign troops out, not just American troops out. So if, if, you, if in fact there was a, a negotiated peace settlement that involved withdrawal of all NATO troops, NATO would be on board with that if that's uh, in terms of we will if there is a negotiated peace deal, then we will support that deal, and, and we are. That's the reason why we are so close involved in the process, and that's also the reason why uh, we brief and involve uh, allies uh, in the process. Uh, uh, but it remains to be seen what kind of deal we will get, uh, and and of course uh, the NATO support to Afghanistan now, uh, as I said, is it's not combat. What we do now is to train assist and help the Afghan forces. And we have to realize that the Afghan forces are now doing what we did for them with 140 combat troops. So there are many problems in Afghanistan and many reasons to be concerned, but at least it is a great achievement that instead of having 140,000 US uh, European NATO troops in Afghanistan, we have 16,000 troops which are enabling the Afghans to fight terrorism themselves. And I think that one of the lessons we have learned from Afghanistan, from Iraq, from Libya and elsewhere is that in the long run it's much better to train local forces than to uh, deploy large number of our own forces in big combat operations. I remember Ambassador Doug Lute when he was uh, also in NATO, he, he said uh, prevention is better than intervention and I totally agree. So, so, so we train local forces in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, to, to, to help them stabilize their own country so we can reduce uh, uh, our presence uh, and our, uh, as I say, combat uh, operation in these countries. Do you feel confident, like, if, you know, there's talk of a, a negotiated peace settlement pretty soon, potentially in a matter of months, if NATO troops were supposed were to withdraw and abandon this, this training mission as part of the negotiated settlement, that the Afghan forces could stand on their own? I mean, they, they continue to have a difficult time. They were, there was a, a district was overrun in Paktika over the weekend and the Afghan forces fled. It, do you feel confident that they could actually hold back, not, not only the Taliban, but also now ISIS? And but, but as I said, we are looking for a peace deal, not a leave deal. Uh, so we need the elements in place uh, to ensure that we uh, can preserve the gains we have made, uh, that we can uh, uh, reduce uh, and, and eventually leave in an orderly way. Uh, but again, uh, how and when and how fast, I think it's a bit early to speculate. NATO will support uh, a negotiated uh, solution because uh, we are close involved in that process uh, and we are prepared that a negotiated solution will also impact our presence. But how and in what way and how fast, uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, and, and of course, we can continue to support an Afghan government if if an Afghan government so wants. Uh, I think, for instance, uh, we will have to continue to provide financial support because what we do is not only to train the Afghan forces, we also uh, fund them. Uh, the United States and other NATO allies provide significant financial support to the Afghan uh, forces. I'd like to touch a little bit on, on burden sharing, which has been a big topic, obviously, with, with President Trump. His national security advisor, John Bolton, said that NATO allies are now spending $100 billion more on defense since President Trump was elected in 2016. Is that true? Yes. Since 2016? Yes. I can be very precise. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you add what, uh, the increase in 2017-18, uh, uh, 19 and what they what we estimate for 20. Uh, so this is over the four-year period. Uh, uh, we actually expect it will be a bit more than 100 billion US uh, dollars, uh, uh, and that's based on what they have already done, also for 17, 18, and the budget uh, and and and, the, and what they have the, uh, also the spending for this year, and then and then uh, all allies have submitted uh, plans uh, for defense spending, uh, and if we also include uh, the estimates for 20, 
20, uh, that adds up to more than 100 billion. So, so uh, President Trump has been very clear on the uh, importance of increased defense spending, and I have said, and I, and I, I can repeat here, that uh, that very clear message is having an impact. Um, uh, the good news is that you know, after years of cutting defense budgets, all allies are now increasing defense spending. Uh, more allies meet the 2% target, uh, and the majority of NATO allies have put forward plans uh, on how to reach 2% within a decade. We have to remember that when we made, made the Defense Investment Pledge in 2014, uh, we didn't promise to reach 2% next year. We promised, promised uh, 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 within a decade. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, we still have a long way to go. Uh, many allies still have a, 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 so a far away from 2%, uh, but uh, we are really moving in the right direction. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I think that's important, partly because the investments provide us with capabilities we need, but also because investments in defense is also an investment in the transatlantic uh, bond. But hasn't the, def you mentioned the Defense and Investment Pledge in 2014, that's really when the spending started to increase among, among members and allies. Uh, ambassador Burns, I believe, and, and Ambassador Doug Lute, who I don't know if he's here, both two former U.S. ambassadors to NATO, worked on a study out of Harvard that said that, in fact, the spending increased starting in 2014, and part of that was the invasion of Crimea, and part of it was this investment pledge. So, I mean, is, is, is President Trump, and in this case, Ambassador Bolton, taking credit for something that was already in the works two years before President Trump was even elected? What I have said is that the clear message from President Trump is having an impact. Uh, uh, we have seen uh, that since 2016 there has been a significant increase. Uh, but you're right that we have seen also increase before that. Uh, with, uh, this, the increase started, I think it was in 15. Uh, that was the first year where we saw increase across Europe and, uh, and Canada. Uh, and we made the pledge in 2014. To be honest, I am, for me it is important not to be too much involved in a domestic uh, political debate in the United States. <laughs> uh, what matters for me is that European allies and Canada are paying more, uh, and they are paying. Uh, and that's good, uh, and, and I also tell them, and they agree, that we should not only pay more or invest more in defense to please the United States. We should pay and invest more in defense because it is in our own security interest. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, all, and all allies agree. All allies have, been, have, have uh, committed to increased defense spending. Uh, because when we reduce tensions, no, sorry, when we reduce defense spending when uh, tensions are going down, we have to be able to increase defense spending when tensions are going up. So NATO allies, also in the United States, reduced defense spending after the end of the Cold War because then tensions went down. And I'm a politician. I know that all politicians prefer, at least most of them, prefer to, uh, to spend money on something else than defense. They like to spend money on education, health, infrastructure. And I told the audience like this before that I was Minister of Finance back in Norway in the 1990s. And I was very good at cutting defense spending. <laughs> uh, but, but then tensions went, went down. So I'm actually, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not ashamed of that. Because then we really thought that we were able to develop a new relationship with Russia. Uh, we had a significant build down of Russian forces in, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and, 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 and then it was fair enough that we reduced defense spending all across uh, the alliance. But then when tensions are going up, when we see that Russia is investing more, when we see that the global balance of power is shifting, then we need to invest more. And the good news is that that's exactly what NATO allies are uh, doing. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic, and to be honest, I'm quite impressed, because, because for many allies, they're not able to borrow. They're not able, again, I will not say so much about the United States, but, but, but you know, for many allies, it is impossible to borrow money, because they have very strict budget rules in the European Union, and or because they are faced with extremely high interest rates if they borrow too much. And they have been through a financial crisis, which makes it uh, as a, uh, impossible to borrow. So if they spend one dollar or one euro extra on defense, they have to spend one euro less on health, education, or something else, or increase taxes. That's not easy. But despite that, they are actually allocating more money for defense. Uh, and, and that shows that they are committed to this alliance. 
So we have, we're going to get to questions in just a couple of minutes, but, but one more, um, not quite yet, but you'll get the first one if you want it. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, you've mentioned unity a bunch of times and the commitment, NATO ally commitment. Are, are you confident at this stage that if, in fact, there, a NATO ally was attacked by Russia, that the other 28 members of the alliance would respond? That yes, and there are several reasons for that. Partly because that's the core uh, sort of treaty obligation they have in, 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 in the Washington Treaty, Article 5, a one for all, all for one. If one ally, ally is attacked, it will be regarded as attack on the whole alliance. That's Article 5. Uh, uh, but second, uh, because they have all stated it again and again, and thirdly, and that's perhaps the most uh, important thing, is that NATO is present. There are US troops in the eastern part of the alliance. There are actually now also US troops in Norway. Uh, we didn't see that uh, not, uh, for, for, for the first time in our history. Um, and, uh, and, and there are German troops and, and, and French troops and, uh, and, 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 and uh, troops from all NATO allies are already in, also deployed combat ready, ready in the eastern part of the lines. So, so, so an attack on any NATO ally, uh, and for me there is no stronger way to demonstrate NATO solidarity than deploying your own forces uh, in the most exposed part of the lines. And that's exactly what the United States and all, all, all the allies are doing. And the last reason why I'm absolutely certain that the whole alliance will respond is that it is in our interest to stand together. I mean, it, NATO is good for Europe, but it's also extremely good for the United States. Uh, it, it's extremely good to have friends and allies. You are, you are, I mean, you are privileged to have 20, uh, 28 friends and allies who are together with you every time. Not only triggering Article 5 after 9-11, uh, but if you compare with China or Russia or any other great power, they don't have that kinds of friends and allies as you have. That makes you stronger. And when I travel around the United States, I meet people who are concerned about the size of, 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 of China. If you're con uh, economic, militarily, and so on. If you're concerned about the size of China, then you should stay in NATO. Because as long as you're in NATO, you are terribly big. Hmm. Because uh, if you add all the other allies, we are 50% of world GDP and 50% of the world military might, as I said. So, 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 NATO has been important, but NATO is actually even more important now because we see this shift of uh, power balance uh, and that makes the importance of strong international institutions, alliance as uh, NATO, even more important. I want to get to questions, but you know, it, it is also important to point out that there are some people who say that NATO was slow to respond to China's growing influence around the world, and, but it seems as if now it's a recognition by NATO that... No, but I, I have to be honest to, to say that NATO has not been focused on China. Uh, for, for we, we have been focused on the Soviet Union and then the fight against the terrorism. Uh, 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 so but the growing influence of China even in, in, in Africa and South America and moving into Europe so now. And NATO, in NATO, is a, NATO is a regional organization. So, so, so we, we, have don't, we don't have any plans of moving into the South China Sea or to, you know, to move into that part of, uh, of, of the world. But uh, despite that, we need now to assess... Uh, uh, the consequences, uh, the security consequences for our allies of the rise of China. Uh, because China is coming closer to us. Uh, China in the Arctic, in Africa, in Europe, uh, in cyberspace. Uh, so there's no way we can not uh, assess and respond uh, to uh, the rise of China. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge is to find the right balance between, between seeing the challenges but also the opportunities uh, and therefore, we have now started for the first time in our history a systematic work among allies uh, to try to create some kind of consensus uh, on the challenges, on, on the opportunities, how to respond. Uh, and, uh, and that just shows that NATO is able to adapt when the world is changing. And one reason why NATO is a success is that we have been able to change and adapt when the world is changing. So we have time for about 15 minutes for questions. Um, I, I'm hoping we can do two at a time, so if you could keep your question kind of short, and so we are, we're generous and don't make the Secretary General remember too much at once. Mm. Sir here, and then ma'am over there. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for being here. Uh, Stephen Shapiro with Benz and the Atlantic Council. I'd like to ask you a question about the defense of frontline states in NATO. 
and um, with a little bit of explanation, and I'll try to be brief. The, the, the way NATO structures frontline, uh, its defense system now is that the frontline states essentially serve as bumpers, like car bumpers, to crumple in a classic Russian uh, armed attack. And then they're there to hold out four, six, seven weeks until the United States can mobilize, get across the Atlantic, join up with the Brits, and fight, its way, fight their way back in and kick the bad guys out. There is some currency now of a, of, a, of, a, of a concept called the porcupine defense, where the frontline states might be somewhat hardened to make them less um, en encroachable uh, with respect to the Russians, such as things such as super sensor arrays under sea, um, inexpensive drone swarms, uh, significant cyber defenses, things which might make the Russian taste for, uh, for coming across the border uh, less, uh, less attractive. I wonder if you have discussed the porcupine defense concept, and if you, even if you haven't, what can you uh, say about it? Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, Dr. Vanessa Neumann. I am um, interim uh, Venezuelan President Juan Guaido's uh, diplomatic representative in the UK, and I've, uh, I've been to this forum several times before, in my civilian capacity. Um, simple question, Colombia is now sort of an observer nation, sort of acceding to NATO. What does that mean in practical terms? We Latin Americans and Venezuelans would like to know. Um, first, uh, on the protection of, uh, as I, I don't use the phrase frontline states, but those states who are bordering uh, uh, Russia. Um, again, I think that you ha we have to understand that what NATO does is that we, we, we deter any attempt uh, to attack uh, any ally. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and we do that by saying that if one ally is attacked, the whole alliance will respond. We don't need, uh, during the Cold War, we had a lot of forces, combat ready forces uh, on the border between East and West uh, Germany. Uh, uh, but we were, uh, but for instance, in my country, Norway, there were no NATO troops, zero NATO troops. And if you go to northern Norway, there is actually, as a, there, there is a lot of land, uh, not so many uh, people, uh, but we felt safe, uh, knowing that, of course, in theory, the Russian, uh, the, the Soviet Union, could invade northern Norway, and we were not, not able to stop them. Also, at least not uh, in, for the first uh, oh, many kilometers down before we were able to to stop them. But we were safe because we, we trusted deterrence. We were able to, to, to protect West Berlin, which was in the middle of, the, of East Germany. Not because we had forces there that were to, able to fight a, an attack by the Soviet Union, but because the Soviet Union knew that if they attacked West Berlin or the Northern Norway, then it would trigger the whole response. I say this because the whole idea that I, 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 the bumpers, and I, I didn't get the other thing, but uh, it doesn't matter. That's not the concept. The concept is to just tell them that if you touch any NATO ally, the whole alliance will be there. And we are the strongest alliance in the world. And we are modernizing our forces, increasing the readiness, and to make sure that no one misunderstands, we deploy some NATO forces in what you call the frontline states. So there's no doubt. It's not possible because NATO will be involved from day one. And as long as they know that, they will not, not attack. Then, of course, we are investing in new technologies and uh, in, 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 uh, in drones and, and, and so on, which will help to, to make that deterrence credible also as uh, our potential adversaries are investing in new technologies. To try to be short, I have to add, uh, to end with uh, uh, one important message. We don't see any imminent threat against any NATO ally. Uh, any NATO ally. Uh, so, so we are not going around and thinking that we will be attacked tomorrow. Except for what I said, terrorist attacks can happen tomorrow in any NATO ally country. And of course, cyber, these hybrid attacks are actually happening every day. Uh, but the uh, armed attack, uh, no imminent threat. Hmm. And on Colombia? And Oh, sorry, Colombia. Now, Colombia is a partner, uh, and the first partner we have in Latin America. So that's a kind of, kind of great achievement. I met the uh, uh, president of Colombia. He came to NATO. It was great to have a, a partner nation from, from Latin America. Um, but the partner nation is a partner. It's not the ally. 
so Article 5 and so on does apply for partners. We have uh, roughly 40 partners around the world, and of course, we cannot say that Article 5 uh, uh, applies for all of them. Uh, but it means that we will work together, we will uh, train together, we will uh, help each other. Uh, different partners participate in different ways, uh, and, and we discuss different ways where we could, for instance, work on how to um, uh, engage in peace processes, because they have been through a peace process in Colombia, uh, and, uh, and also to fight terrorism and so on. So, so we can work on practical issues, uh, but it's not about Article 5 or, 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 or becoming a full member of the Alliance. Two more uh, in the back over here, and ma'am, right here. Elmar Tevil. Elmar Tevilsen with ZDF German Television. Thank you, Mr. Stoltenberg, for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, I was wondering, NATO was founded on the core values of democracy, human rights, and also the rule of law. Are you in any way concerned about the erosion of those core values when you look at countries like Turkey, Poland, Hungary, Italy, just in recent years, and some members of Congress probably would argue even the US? Suzanne Spalding from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, Secretary General, thank you for being here. I wanted to pick up on your comments about um, hybrid threats, or what we might call gray zone threats. Uh, I spoke about a year ago with a former member of the NATO parliament, NATO parliamentarian, uh, who was speaking with some East uh, European intelligence officers in 2010, who said Putin then had three top goals. Weaken NATO, weaken the NATO alliance, weaken the bonds between the EU and the US, and undermine the credibility of justice systems and the media as arbiters of truth. Russia is using information operations to, con to achieve these goals, and how does NATO think about those information operations and how to counter them? Uh, uh, first, on the core values. NATO is founded on some core values, democracy, the rule of law, and, uh, and individual liberty. And, uh, and I stress and uh, highlight or underline that many times in my conversations in different uh, NATO capitals, because these values are of great importance for the Alliance and for uh, me. Um, because I just believe in those values. They're better than, uh, democracy is better than uh, uh, authoritarian regimes. Uh, freedom is better than oppression. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think we have proven that these values are very strong. Then, of course, there are some concerns expressed uh, from different NATO allies about uh, uh, to what extent uh, all allies are able to live up to these standards. I think that one of the important things that NATO provides is a platform for an open and free discussion about that. So, so, so then, then, then we meet, we discuss, we may, be, we may uh, agree, we may, we may disagree, but at least NATO should be a platform for also raising these concerns, uh, and then hopefully that will enable us all to, uh, to, 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 to deliver even better on uh, 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 these uh, core uh, 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 values. Let me add oh, no, one very brief thing, is that we are 29 allies from both sides of the Atlantic. We are different, and sometimes we disagree. But despite those disagreements and differences, we have always been able to uh, 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 unite around our core tasks to protect and defend each other, and that's important that we continue uh, to uh, uh, do. Then on hybrid, um, we, we do a lot uh, to counter uh, information campaigns or disinformation. Uh, partly we increase awareness, because I think this is about, about very much being aware of how vulnerable we are uh, when uh, someone tried to interfere in our domestic processes. So to share best practices, to, to, to learn from each other, uh, to inform each other about uh, different uh, attempts in, in interfering in our uh, uh, democratic institutions or, or, or undermine our democratic in institutions uh, is extremely important. We have strengthened our cyber defenses, both the NATO cyber defenses, but also help to uh, strengthen the cyber defenses of NATO allied countries. We conduct big exercises. Uh, you know, sometimes it's about very simple things, about what they call cyber hygiene, just to behave responsible uh, when you have a computer or anything like that. Um, uh, uh, and, and, of course, we provide facts. 
when we see that uh, there is some disinformation out there, uh, we have a web, uh, also online, uh, some, what do you call it, website where you can uh, have a lot of facts uh, related to some of the disinformation uh, uh, we see uh, presented by Russia and, uh, and uh, others. Uh, but I think that the most important thing is that we need, need a critical and independent press. I am, I'm a politician. I've been quite irritated at many journalists many times, but I'm in favor of them. Uh, uh, as a meaning, meaning that, that, that they have to ask the difficult questions. They have to check their sources, and that's the best guarantee against this information. Uh, so, so our core value uh, is about creating a society which is resilient against attempts to try to, uh, to interfere. Um, then the last thing I would say that it's very easy to be concerned. That's, in a way, the easiest thing in the world. Uh, but, but we should not be, we should also be a bit optimistic. Because despite all these attempts to, to weaken NATO, NATO is not weak. And actually, if you look at the opinion polls, there is great support, record high support for NATO. So if I was campaigning for NATO, it would have been a big victory all, already. So those who are trying to undermine the public support for NATO have not succeeded. Even in, also not even, but also in the United States, there is record high support for NATO. So, uh, so uh, yes, we should be aware attempts uh, to, to weaken NATO, uh, but so far they have not succeeded. Actually, there is a stronger support for NATO than it has been for many years. So we have time for one more very quick question, if someone has a quick one. Sir? Charlie Dunlap from Duke Law School. Mr. Secretary, we're seeing that conscription is being looked at by a lot of European countries. Do you think that that trend will continue, especially to get the high tech and cyber talent that modern militaries need? Answer just, that. We'll just do the one. Oh, yeah. Okay. To be honest, I, I, I don't know. Uh, um, uh, uh, I think that. Um, I, as a, my own country, I'm sorry to use Norway, but I know Norway the best. Um, we have conscription. Actually, we have conscription for men and women. It was introduced when I was prime minister. Uh, and again, uh, I was very skeptical in the beginning, but I ended up campaigning for female or women conscription. Uh, because then I understood, because you, if you have not half of the population, but 100% of the population, you get really uh, as an even better people. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the advantage of having conscription is that you can re rec recruit really the best. The problem is, to be honest, is that I think in most countries, you don't, no country, very few countries will afford to have so many people in the armed forces. So again, to use my own country, we have conscription, but the reality is that I think it's 50% or something of the cohort, is that what you call it? Uh, uh, so do military service because we, we, we can't afford to have a bigger army. Um, so uh, therefore I'm a bit uh, reluctant or careful to have any clear advice to other allies. Uh, but the important thing is that we need the best and the brightest and we need more and more skilled people uh, because we are now in the midst of a big transformation of our armed forces. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, autonomous weapon systems, big data, all that will change uh, the nature of warfare more fundamentally than uh, the Industrial Revolution did. So therefore we need really the best people in our armed forces to maintain the technological edge, which has always been so important for NATO. But again, I'm a strong optimist because we have proven again and again that we are able to change when the world is changing. I'll take a, a point of personal privilege as the moderator and ask you one more. You already have disclosed to us your days of protesting. Did you have long hair as well, or was it just your friends? Uh, no, no. <laughs> no. You, can, you can Google me, and you will see uh, long hair, the end Stoltenberg. We, we uh, all will be. It'll, be. it'll be posted on the Aspen website by the end of the evening. Um, we, uh, I also understand that as a younger man, you, looked at, you wanted to be a professor. Economics and statistics? Yes, so I, I, I was active in the student politics uh, as a young man. Then I decided that that was not for me. I was going to do something really serious. Uh, so I finished my exams um, in economics or econometrics, which is mathematics and statistics. And I started to work in the Center Bureau of Statistics to do something uh, serious. 
And then I was asked to become uh, Deputy Minister for Environment back in 1990, and I promised my wife only to stay for one year. Yeah. I've stayed there, and I've been in politics uh, for 30 years or something. Uh, <laughs> As you sit here in Aspen answering questions about a potential nuclear arms race yeah. with Russia, do you Which wonder is, whether you made the right choice there? Or? No, I, I don't regret. But to be honest, every time when I'm ba uh, back, uh, back in Norway, I, I have a kind of longing for that academic life. Uh, 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 but I think it's a bit too late for me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I will, uh, yeah. Well, I, Ms. And Ms. this is also kind of quite a good life, to be honest. Yeah. So, well, Mr. Uh, Secretary General, thank you so much for your time, the spirited discussion. Thank you.